What's up, everybody? What's up? Happy Thursday. How are y'all doing? How are you doing, Marone? Happy Thursday. I'm doing pretty good. Pretty happy, I guess. You know, so upholding yeah. the happy Thursday. <laughs> Do it. For me, I tried to get the lighting kind of bright in here, but now I'm like blinded. So people blinded always ask me like, the yeah. They're like, why do you blink like 30 times a minute? And I'm like, there's so many lights in my no eyes. I'm just idea. trying my best. Yeah, seriously, when they are just like hitting you. And then you start, the, yeah. the worst is when you start sweating too. Oh, you're yeah. Like, oh, God, I, I don't want anybody to see that. <laughs> I'm glistening. You're glistening. That's me. what it is. How's everybody else doing? I hope your Thursday is going very well. We have had some pretty significant announcements take place in the past 24 hours, one of which is our first story, which was leaks and rumors and everything surrounding it, but it finally became official, is that Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War is happening. It's official. So Treyarch's next installment in the Call of Duty franchise is a return to familiar territory. And earlier today, the developer released the first teaser trailer for Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. The teaser first discovered by Charlie Intel is made up entirely of newsreels and historical footage, likely providing a background for the game's plot. The trailer itself is heavy on the Cold War intrigue and introduces players to a Soviet spy codename Perseus. According to the teaser, some light and some light Googling, Perseus was never caught and infiltrated deeply into some of the most secretive U.S. defense institutions in order to give the USSR an edge in the global arms race. The trailer centers around an actual television interview with KGB defector Yuri Bezmenov, who describes the slow and careful ways that the Soviet Union was working to undermine the United States. Bezmenov, a former Soviet journalist who became a prominent anti-communist author and speaker in the West after his defection, explains that the Soviet had a careful decades-long plan to infiltrate and destabilize America. Bezmenov says this, it's a slow process which, he call, which we called active measures. He explained that there are four stages to this plan, which eventually lead to the normalization, which he describes as, quote, what will happen in the United States if you allow all the schmucks to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., who will promise loads of things, no matter whether the promises were fulfilled or not. Finally, he ends with a strong warning. The time bomb is ticking with every second. The disaster is coming closer and closer. The danger is real. Thank you so much for subs by the way thanks to Thank everyone in so chat much, supporting everybody. us we hope you enjoy your emote um we're waiting on marone and i each having our own little um cartoon. emojis yeah so while um all of this is explained the teaser shows flashes of everything from the vietnam war civil rights protests government meetings and speeches given by ronald reagan the teaser's release was timed with members of the call of duty community completing a multi-day arg that involved various forms of cold war style code breaking which led them to secret rooms inside the verdansk mask in call of map in call of duty Warzone, which seems to imply there could be a connection between black ops cold war and and war zone. The ARG also includes a variety of videotapes, each corresponding to a year in Call of Duty uh, Cold War history, with similar clips to the ones in the teaser. The new Call of Duty is the latest in Treyarch's Black Ops series, but since the latest iteration was set in the year 2043, it's not exactly clear how this game fits into the timeline. Since this game appears to be set in the Cold War, it's pretty likely it won't take place in the future. But we don't know if this is maybe an alternate Cold War that has led up to the events of the rest of the series, or maybe it's actually some kind of, some kind of hard reset on the Black Ops storyline. The trailer ends with the reveal of the Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War title and the news that it will be revealed in full on August 26th. I think this is a, a really cool way of, of, you know, sharing this information in this super secretive uh, manner that they're just like, it, it really feels like they're feeling themselves with this. Do you know what I mean? Like when you watch this trailer, they're like, oh yeah, we're, we're so secretive. Do you know what I mean? This is that kind of, right. this is that kind of experience. 
they're totally setting the tone. I like how they've made it kind of feel like a movie, you know, with all these this footage in here, all this, you know, story and lore. How you have to actually code break in the game to, you know, reveal yeah. what's happening here. I am always curious as to, you know, how historians view games that gamify this whole experience. Yeah. I know Shroud was saying it was like really cool and realistic that, you know, they're using footage from the actual Cold War. But when people use the word realistic and Call of Duty together, I'm always like, but is it? Is it um, <laughs> jumping and shooting isn't that accurate, but it is. Right. Um, but I think um, it seems like they're very, you know, immersed in the story. And, you know, this might be kind of like an alternate Cold War timeline that happened, yeah. which I think might be, you know, a really cool take on the whole thing. I think they've done, you know, a great job and at least like having a big hype factor. I agree uh, completely with that. And and the other thing, too, is what something I just saw in the chat and is what I remember a lot of in, individuals saying was like, uh, Black Ops was amazing. A lot of people loved that storyline. They loved the character Mason. They were really just uh, uh, impressed with the storytelling that went into that mm -hmm. and that overall experience. If they did a hard reset, they might actually, you know, put off a lot of those fans from Black Ops that if they can find a way to intertwine the two or, yeah. you know, you know, still maintain the the integrity of storytelling from the from the first one. I think then you'll you'll win over a lot more uh, of the previous version fans and the new ones, especially from Warzone being free to play. I think so too. And I think it's a given that we're going to see elements of this in Warzone. I think it would be just a mistake and it would be weird if they didn't add, you know, these Cold War elements into Warzone. So I'm looking forward to, you know, what they're going to do with that. If there's going to be events maybe in Warzone that tie in with um, with Black Ops Cold War. If, yeah. if you've played, you know, if you're going to play the new game and then you play Warzone afterwards, you know, maybe you see a lot of overlap um, that really bring the Call of Duty kind of story full circle and, and make yeah. it a cohesive experience of when you're playing a Call of Duty game, like it's a Call of Duty game, no matter what, you know, faction of the game you're actually playing. Uh, completely too. The the question of um, will there be zombie zombies? I, I would expect that there's a zombies mode. The, the think so? belief in the leaks and the data mining is saying that that is going to be there. That hasn't been officially uh, put out there, but they have a lot with the whole like nuclear aspect of the bomb because the, the expectation is on August 26, which is the big event that's going to take place. Supposedly it, it's going to happen while people are inside Verdansk. Um, people believe that the bomb's going to go off on the 26th and it's going to completely change the, the map. Um, I think they'll be able to get away with the zombies thing as doing like this radioactive aspect to True. their infection and how they became zombies. That's interesting that it'll kind of be like because of the nuclear, you know, fallout, it, it causes whatever mutations that yeah. create zombies there. I, th I think would be a cool way to tie that in and make that more fantastical, you know, while also being um, very much grounded in the world that Warzone's already created. Yeah, so it's going to be cool seeing this first event that they're going to do like this uh, to this extent. Um, knowing it's going to happen on the 26th, if you are playing, make sure you're dropping into Verdansk checking out this live event, seeing what happens, but know to tune into DGN afterwards because we will be showing you more about that when that event goes down. We will, and also make sure you've got enough disk space on yes. your hard drive. You're running those updates. You're making sure your game is ready to go for this August 26th event um, because we all know that it's a very big file. Never more sound words spoken when it's like, Call of Duty, make sure that hard drive's ready. Yep, yep. Um, so for our next story is another, you know, event, but in Sea of Thieves, as Sea of Thieves summer event is all about the little things and they're adding new content to the game. So Rare has released the August update for Sea of Thieves, which kicks off an event known as the Summer of Sea of Thieves. This event is far less involved or cinematic, cinematic as the Ashen Winds update, which introduced fiery pirates commanding spectral ships but it has a lot of nice bonuses and reasons for players to log in regularly. The August event is called Hunters of the Deep and it tasks players with hunting down Megalodons in order to collect their teeth. I wonder if this is hearkening back to, you know, an older event. This article is from 2020. I double checked because if you look up, you know, um, Summer of the Eve Summer event, hunting down Megalodons is something that happened in 2018 as well. So this event in 2020 also tasks So I guess players. summer season is Megalodon season. 
It seems so. So you've got to collect their teeth and shark teeth can unlock a new set of ship cosmetics called the Shrouded Ghost, allowing players to make their sloop or galleon far more spooky. And if players miss the August event, they'll be able to pick the Shrouded Ghost ship set up through the Pirate Emporium for real money. And I think that this is totally done on purpose to kind of line up with or come right after Discovery Channel's Shark Week. Ooh, yeah, that's perfect timing. Yeah. Great observation. I love me some Shark Week because alongside the shark hunting event, there will be a series of limited time challenges that do offer rewards. These are mostly simply things like repairing one ship, selling certain items, or pulling off in-game challenges like talking to a specific set of NPCs around the world. And these challenges will run from August 19th until September 30th, giving players some time to wrap everything up and earn their rewards. There are a lot of quality of life and accessibility changes in the patch as well, including a feature that claims to provide text translations for players speaking other languages and voice chat, which is pretty cool. There's also more rewards from skeleton ships, more Ashen Lords on islands to battle, smarter Megalodons, and less recoil that pushes players back upon vomiting. So that's nice. That is and nice. In addition to this, there's also a Fighting Frogs ship set reveal. Yeah, so I've got the trailer here. Let's check this out. This is uh, heavily inspired by, if you can think of a game that's pretty iconic, just check it out. Pretty awesome ship. Yeah, it's kind of random as well, I feel. Yeah. Inspired by Battle Toads. I love it. This is so good. I was like, I need that ship. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I wonder how this came to be. You know, Battle Toads fighting, fighting frogs making their way in here in this summer event. That's so funny. And I love, I love it. EG's like, yeah, only OGs will know, specifically those around Rare. So, oh, cheese only. Yeah. Battletoads was that game that if, I don't know if anyone ever played it, you could never get past this one level. That's the, the, the whole thing. It was just extremely difficult game, but there's this one specific level where you're like on these like little bikes trying to get by and uh, you're trying to like jump over stuff. It just, it's so hard. And then you get past that. Yeah. The motorcycle level, you literally get past that and you're falling down this like, uh, um, uh, like a shaft and it's even more difficult it, it, it just gets oh, harder geez. on harder on harder it's one of those games that it's like if you actually played it you remember this for never completing it i think it's interesting how i see so many articles about sea of thieves whenever there's a new patch or an update you know a lot of the big gaming news websites will talk about sea of thieves but other than that like on twitter or among streamers i don't hear that much about sea of thieves do you or does the chat I don't either. <laughs> yes, EG, I, I do remember. Um, <laughs> I I don't see it that often. It's not like one that's like from most prominent streamers is always being talked about. What I do know is the community is, is still pretty big and it is still always around like third or fourth most popular streamed game. But I don't True. really see like a lot of the the well-known streamers are like, hey guys, playing some Sea of Thieves today. You know what I mean? That's not really yeah. something that's happening. It's kind of graduated, you know, from being the new game to leveling out and maybe like plateauing with a strong community, but it hasn't fizzled away. I wonder if just, you know, providing new content or a lot of community support has kept a lot of players around because I've noticed new games do struggle with this, that after the initial, you know, first wave of hype, they kind of just mm -hmm. become not that popular, like Hyperscape, you know, was the top of Twitch for a day or two. And then yeah. I haven't seen anyone playing it. I don't really know of anyone playing it. It seems like they've had some trouble, you know, keeping their player base. But Sea of Thieves is going strong. It really is. And Rare's focused on the content creation, the community creation, just everything about what they're doing with this game has all been about the longevity of bringing people together and making sure everyone's having a, a fun time. And it is a fun game. Like when you play it, you're like, I really do enjoy myself. And those battles against the Megalodons are no joke. It's They are very, very heart pounding experiences. 
Uh, Meg made a good point that maybe this was uh, also coinciding with The Meg, which uh -huh. was that film about that Megalodon that came out, you know, tying in with Shark Week. I think it would be cool if, I think there is another Pirates of the Caribbean movie coming out, if they do, you know, something with that. I yeah. think there's... Uh, there's kind of a spot of it's cool to have branded stuff, but if there's too much branded stuff, it seems very sellout y. But I think yeah. there's a cool, you know, middle ground like having battle toads, you know, in the Sea of Thieves, um, yeah. that can, you know, keep keep the new content and the excitement going. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool to see Rare doing a wonderful, wonderful job. But our next story is this in fact, video games coming together to fight and save the planet. So this is from a report from the United Nations Environment Program, which is the first time you know we've sourced from the UN um, on our on our show to show you that we're bringing first. real gaming news. <laughs> Real legit gaming news, no, you know, less rumors today and, and more of legit stuff. So as bushfires were raging across Australia in December 2019, players of Space Ape video games reached out to the company and asked what they could do to help. The London-based firm quickly put an in-game purchase into several of its mobile titles with all proceeds going to either a wildlife or a humanitarian charity working in the area. In just four days, that company raised $120,000 through their game. So uh, the former head of content at Space Ape, Space Ape Games, Deborah Mensa Bonsu, said that this just speaks to how much people want to do good. And she now runs her own consultancy focused on games for social impact. Now, the video game industry is poised to roll up its sleeves and do even more for the planet. In August 2020, some of the biggest names in mobile gaming unveiled a series of environmentally themed missions and messages that will be integrated into popular titles, such as Angry Birds 2, Golf Clash, which I haven't played, and Subway Surfers, which I also haven't played. The additions will encourage players to do things like combat, cl combat climate change or protect endangered wolves. The initiative is part of a push by the United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP, to work with game developers to raise awareness about pressing environmental issues. Sam Barat, Chief of Education and Advocacy with the UNEP, says this, that video gaming is one of the biggest communication mediums on the planet. We aim to support the industry to encourage gamers to be educated, inspired, and activated around the wider environmental agenda, and so far it seems to be working. Globally, 2.6 billion people play video games and a growing number are taking an interest in the environment and conservation. A 2019 UNEP report, Playing for the Planet, found that video games could engage billions to contribute to solutions to social and environmental challenges. A quick note that that number a few years ago was like 1.5 billion. So the fact that it's jumped up a billion wow. in a few years is crazy. Now, when you said 2.6, I was like, whoa. I remember when I was saying That's it was like 1.4. Um, <laughs> so the video game industry has yearly revenues of $140 billion. That's more than Hollywood, Bollywood, and recorded music sales combined. In 2017, 666 million people watched other people play games on YouTube and Twitch. That's more than the combined audience of HBO, ESPN, and Netflix. And according to the UNEP report, channeling... Even a small portion of that attention and the industry revenues towards the planet would create tremendous impact in the real world. I think this is a cool trend and just to, you know, pause for a moment to reflect on what we've covered of this new trend of reaching people through games such as, you know, Fortnite in their party royale putting a video about, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, why we should care about this movement. And they put that in Fortnite and they're putting, you know, movie trailers in Fortnite and a lot of different advertising really in Fortnite and using Fortnite to advertise to its players versus, you know, what we think of when we usually think of marketing, which is maybe digital marketing, like promoted tweets, promoted videos, ads that you you can't skip. Um, and this is like an innovative way to actually, you know, reach people um, in a way that they might actually, you know, pause to care about it. Yeah, I, I would like to think that most of us gamers realize when an experience is gamified, we take away a lot more from it. And there tends to be this kind of like imprint um, mm -hmm. that usually carries with us. So 
So looking at it that way, like, hey, we have 2.6 billion people. And if we can even get just a small percentage of that, you know, the the, the amount of, of ripple effect it has on on benefiting the world and, and potentially, mm-hmm. you know, working to save the planet as we as we need to. Um, it is a it is a good thought to go, hey, how do I teach these individuals this information? But they also have a fun time while doing it. Mm-hmm, exactly. So. Uh, This article, you know, from UNEP goes on uh, to address playing for the planet and Space Ape is one of the 25 members of UNEP's Playing for the Planet Alliance, which is an initiative that aims to harness the power of gaming to encourage action on climate change. The project, which launched in 2019, has reached more than 970 million players. And joining the alliance, game companies make commitments ranging from integrating green activations into games to reducing their emissions to supporting the global environmental agenda. The Alliance held a Green Game Jam earlier this year, which saw 11 mobile game companies compete to add a sustainability element to one of their existing games, a so-called Green Nudge. The objectives, including asking players to make personal commitments like skipping meat on Mondays or biking to work or designing green environment solar panels or electric cars into games. Space Ape, whose game Transformers Earth Wars contains environmental themes in the original storyline, picked renewable energy. For the updated release, it brought both good and evil Transformers together to find a new technology to harvest Earth's energy resources more sustainably. And right now, I can't help but think that in a year or two, we're going to see Ninja like at a UN conference, you know, addressing climate change in gaming, which I just think would be great, but also such a meme at the yeah, same time. Yeah, completely, completely. Because the the uh, <laughs> Deborah Mensa Bonsu uh, was actually saying that the company wanted to give players a call to action. We know how those work. So it asked them to take this pledge to even switch their light bulbs from incandescents to LEDs. I can just and see how- Ninja standing up there and he has like the <laughs> LEDs as he's talking. Right, go green. He'll yeah. like dye his hair green too or something. Oh my God. So California-based Pixelberry Studios focused on climate change in its title, Choices. This game centers on a young woman who returns to her coastal hometown where there has been a large fish die off. The girl's younger sister is convinced the die off is connected to climate change despite skepticism from local politicians and business owners. The player's role is to help their younger sister rally others and raise awareness about climate change in that game. So the uh, uh, writer, one of the writers of Pixelberry, Saren Walker, said that the team had read dozens of articles about younger generations experiencing anxiety around climate change. Yeah, Uh, there was a recent survey of millennials. 30,000 individuals under the age of 30 from 186 countries confirmed this, finding that climate change and destruction of nature were the most critical issues for them. Walker said, we were all really inspired by Greta Thunberg's story, referring to the young Swedish environmental activist. Walker went on to say, anyone at the company who has kids is thinking about what kind of world are they going to leave to their children? We wanted to show people that they could actually do a lot as an individual. And there has been a shift in the gaming industry. If we take a look at it, the gaming industry is also considering how it can become carbon neutral, or in some cases, carbon positive which is a welcome move for a sector that has been scrutinized for its environmental footprint. Currently, 50 million tons of electronic waste is generated annually, and with that number projected to reach 120 million tons by 2050. Supercell, which makes mobile titles recently committed to going entirely carbon neutral and offsetting the carbon dioxide used by players when playing their games, Rovio and Space Ape aim to take similar action. The Playing for the Planet Alliance will share guidance with its members on how to decarbonize. With Sony leading a working group that includes other console makers, the Alliance will help devise a new carbon calculator for the industry, develop fresh guidance on offsetting, and forge new collective commitments around the restoration of forest landscapes, which help absorb carbon emissions. Mensa Bonsu said, when we set out on this journey, we wanted to help others in the industry too. If we all do our part, we can make a change in the world. I think this is the good fight. I am just so exhausted about fighting to slow down climate change. Um, I think it's good that the UN is 
you know, kind of putting it on the companies more than the consumers because, yeah. you know, I recycle, I turn off the lights, you know, I drive a hybrid, I don't drive yeah. a lot, I use public transportation when I can, yeah. but just me doing that isn't going to really, you know, slow the problem. It has to be done on a bigger scale. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a good first step to, you know, have skins or items and games that gamers can buy that will go towards charitable causes because, you know, I personally like to reach out to or, or donate to the charities directly themselves, but maybe a lot of younger gamers or, or gamers in general, they don't know how to do that. Maybe they don't care to do that. Maybe they won't donate at all if they have to go out of their way to do it. So, you know, integrating it into a game, I think is a good like introduction to getting people to help in a way that's, you know, not going to um, detract from their daily routines, even though I often detract from my daily routine to do things like this. Yeah, this is a, um, a great trend that is becoming more in the uh, uh, public spotlight. Uh, we're talking about it more. Um, mm -hmm. I'm excited to see how some of these bigger developers respond to this, having this awareness with you know, offering uh, different types of, you know, packages that you buy in game and their donations are going to these charities. You know, one of the things about Humble Bundle, which is great, um, is they they kind of take this, they take this approach, right? You get these bundle right. of games and there's like some sort of charity or donation that's being given mm -hmm. that if we could see that happening within, you know, you're buying these packs within Fortnite or I'm buying these, you know, uh, uh, packs within Warzone, that they have these donations, which Call of Duty did happen to do this, which was for veterans. Uh, there was a donation going Ooh. towards, you know, helping veterans, which I bought the pack because it was the all of it was going to to them. So it's no skin off a developer's back to create a visual, create a little, you know, cool flare piece, put it on there for what it is, and then just take the proceeds that come in and do some good with it, you know. Right. And especially those items are popular. Like I think Pink Mercy was for um, to donate to breast cancer research, I think. And the Pink Mercy skin in Overwatch was so popular. There's so much fan art. Everyone loved it. You know, people would buy it just for, you know, Pink Mercy anyway. And I yeah. think, you know, that being a donation was also just kind of like an added bonus. And I don't know how many people actually cared about the charity because I didn't hear much about the charity. They cared about the skin, but the end result was still a lot of money was given to charity. So it was a cool way to, you know, um, encourage people to, you know, maybe make a charitable donation that they otherwise wouldn't have, you know, even yeah. if they don't care about the cause, you know, it's, it's still good. I think it's good PR, if anything, which I hate to say that it's like, it's, it's good PR to, you know, donate yeah. as just a show. Like at least you're still donating that Correct. money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For me, I'm, I'm okay with having the discussion about why did you do this, but it's like, but you are donating. So I'm kind of like, you know what I mean? It's that torn yeah. kind of approach but it's interesting though because this article brings up something that is our next story which was this um green game jam that that took the green mobile game jam that took place and it's mm -hmm. actually really cool i was able to find a video that put a collection together of the games that were Very shown cool. at mm -hmm. the game jam because this was able to bring 250 million people to rally to protect the planet so this report is from Nairobi, August 18th, 2020. Another Some first. Big, another first. Some of the biggest names in mobile gaming today with a combined active user base of 250 million players unveiled a series of environmental activations they'll be integrating into live games such as Subway Surfers, Angry Birds 2, and Golf Clash, as we mentioned earlier. During the first ever Green Mobile Game Jam, which took place from March to April 20th at the height of the COVID pandemic, developers and CEOs from 11 companies committed to integrate these green activations, such as new modes, maps, or buildings, themes, events, storylines, and messaging. The UNEP facilitated Playing for the Planet Alliance supported the Green Mobile Game Jam, whose organizers hope that the shared learning and new practice represents a new turning point for green thinking and game design for mass audience mobile games. John, uh, sorry, uh, John, Ander sorry, Anger Anderson, the executive director of UNP, said this, that we are excited to see the gaming industry throw its weight behind global efforts to reverse the climate crisis. The climate energy needs all hands on deck and reaching out to 250 million gamers. 
which we hope to inspire audiences to take action. John Erner, CEO of Space Ape, who helps oversee the jam, said, I was skeptical whether we could pull it off, especially during lockdown, but it was really inspiring to see companies who are normally very competitive come together and deliver some really great work. He said, I see a huge amount of potential here for our industry and player communities going forward. The results of the jam, activation designs and timelines for implementation can be seen on the Green Game Jam page and these are activations from a place like Mag Interactive that will be running awareness and tree planting themed events in their games WordBrain and WordBrain 2. Cybo will be launching a world tour stop in Subway Surfers, which will ask the community to take action on the front lines of the climate crisis. Space Ape, which we were talking about before, will be educating and engaging players about the benefits of renewable energy through their game Transformers Earth Wars. Wildworks has introduced new renewable energy choices such as solar and wind power that reward players with special eco credits and unlocks in the Animal Jam. And we also have uh, Playdemic, which will be seeking to educate and activate millions of mobile gamers in their game Golf Clash. Fingersoft will be adding recharge stations with solar panels and Hill Climb Racing 2. Rovio will be hosting two in-game events in Angry Birds 2 around the theme of reforestation and will share links with players where they can learn more about reforestation efforts and how they can contribute. And the list continues and is still going strong with Pixelberry, which will design a new book in choices that will see two sisters raising awareness about climate change while their family's fishing business is affected by a major fish die off. Creative Mobile will be restoring biodiversity through special events to fun fundraise for the Wolf Conservation Trust in their game, Zoocraft, the Animal Family. Future Games of London are shining a light on melting polar ice with a new game update in Hungry Shark World Arctic Extinction. Game Duel will be providing the Belote.com players with practical information about sustainability that they can use in their daily life. The participants of the jam were asked to address themes ranging from climate change, supporting action around reforestation, and restoring nature to exploring how games can integrate education on renewable energy. Green Game Jam participants voted Playdemic as overall winner, MAG Interactive as most adoptable for their collaboration with Trees Please, and Creative Mobile as first to market. Wildworks emerged as UNEP favorite. And some activations have already been integrated, and the rest will go live by early 2021 or sooner. The Playing for the Planet Alliance is partnering with Google Play to promote eligible games with the activations later this year. And next year, organizers hope that the additional companies will sign up to participate in the jam and potentially reaching up to 1 billion gamers with activations. One thing that I hate about this, which is of no fault to the UN, is that this hasn't really crossed over into gamer culture, which is why I want to see, you know, the bubble that is the gaming industry really bleed and more with the mainstream. Because this was posted, you know, by the UN, there was an article by the BBC, but among gaming, you know, gaming companies, gaming publications, I didn't really see anything about this. I've seen no mention of this project. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen anyone talking about it. And this is huge. This, this is. is absolutely massive. Yeah, this is a huge moment for uh, this movement within gaming and to see the numbers as big as they are starting out and then to also recognize what they're talking about. We're talking a potential of 1 billion activations right. next year. That's that's a huge number to start to see uh, a, a massive amount of people in the world. You're talking potentially one seventh of the world's population began to um, work towards this universal effort to make the world a better place by contributing to the places and helping make it possible that we can have a sustainable environment and not have to suffer in the next 20, 30 years because we've just not been taking care of the things that we need to be taking care of. Right, and I think that, uh, you know, it's great that this is adding more to the dialogue because in my day-to-day, -day, especially when I'm just inside, you know, my apartment by myself, I don't see a lot of, you know, um, efforts about climate change, I guess. If I'm on Twitch, you know, I don't really hear about it. On Twitter, I don't see a lot, you know. I hear about these things because I seek them out because I follow, you know, news publications that report on these kinds of things. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people, it's not part of their day-to-day. -day. You know, it's easy to forget about. It's maybe not at the forefront of their mind, especially right now. Um, and I think 
1 billion people reached is not anything to overlook. Um, I would be interested to see, you know, if more companies are going to adopt this or participate or, you know, see what they can do or prepare for, you know, next year's game jam um, with Google Play um, partnering with this. I'd like to see maybe Apple Arcade partner with this. We haven't heard anything from Apple about this um, and see what this can actually do moving yeah. forward, at least to raise awareness, you know, about the action we have to take take because you have to raise awareness before you know maybe you can generate enough people that care enough to make a big change um i think one person can do a lot but it it does matter that you know more people care yeah so i i just want to take a moment and say that this is a strong start for this movement because i thought you were going to take a moment and address what you're <laughs> drinking <laughs> this is hilarious I, I, I kid you not i've just been watching it i didn't want to say anything <laughs> But I was like, how close can I get the can to the mic, but away from the mic? So nice. it's there. Oh, my God. This is hilarious. But yeah, Ray Ray wins the contest there. But here's the thing. Can you guess what type of LaCroix it is that I'm drinking? I just discovered this flavor, and it's delicious. It is delicious. Also, um, thank you so much for the dono. Thank, yeah, thank you, so you so much, much. Kai. Sorry, Maroon, continue. <laughs> it's okay. I just love this movement starting off so strong. It's very promising that um, a lot of individuals within our age group and younger are becoming aware of these things because there is a, mm -hmm. a living generation amongst us that wasn't thinking about this stuff that we now are living and moving into being like, oh, hey guys, we gotta, we gotta clean up this mess here. So this is really cool. Hats off to those humans out there that are uh, uh, a part of this movement. Thank you for being a part of it. And thank you to all the individuals that are actually uh, working to push this forward, especially within a $2.6 billion community, $2.6 billion uh, person community uh, within gaming. This is big, big news. Um, and I'm glad to hear it. I hope we get more updates. You know, I hope um, we hear some good things about, you know, these uh, climate change themes, you know, coming into games. But our next topic is actually an official gameplay trailer that we're going to do a watch and react to for Black Myth Wukong. I watched a little bit of this and I stopped and I was like, this looks really good. So Black Myth Wukong comes from a Chinese developer called Game Science Studios. They just released the footage for their game, Black Myth Wukong. Let's go ahead and check out this amazing trailer. I like it already. Yeah. Wait for it, Kai. Yeah, it feels so Sekiro. It looks so much like Sekiro. I know, different country. This voice actor is great, by the way. Really good. They're like singing this whole thing, too. Really good. I'm upvoting and subscribing to Black Myth as we speak. <laughs> I'm ready to buy it. I love how this says it's a pre-alpha build and it already looks beautiful it and looks, finished. It looks, it looks next done. gen. Like this straight up yeah. looks next gen. Oh, Guff, that gameplay's coming. This star is already so cool. I don't think I really see anything like this in games where no. you follow a little. It, it makes me think of following the bird and like, or the, the scout in Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Looks 
looks tough. Oh, snap. <laughs> That's so badass. That's so cool. I love the music. Yeah. Ooh. So, for those of you who don't know, just pull this up from Wikipedia. The Monkey King, known as Sun Wukong, is a legendary figure best known as one of the main characters in a 16th century Chinese novel journey into the West. Um, the story takes place in southern China, um, and the book follows the story of a humble Buddhist monk who travels from southern China to India to bring back holy texts and enlighten his countrymen. <laughs> Yeah, he is, uh, he is the monkey king. Once they show his face, we'll, we'll see that. This looks baller. Someone it said really it has does. a fable feel. I'm kind of picking up on that too. Oh snap, new weapon. Nice. Crispy says, I pull up with that stick. Yeah, they call me Wukong. That's a line. It needs to go, it needs to go into the song. Yeah. Right away. What's, what's that dropping? What's that oh, mixing? that's so cool. Like right away turns into the little bug. God. That's cool. Ooh, what's what that? What in God's name is that? Yes. Cool. Philip says, I hope this is as relevant as GTA 5. <laughs> Yeah, they gave like English subtitles in the beginning, but then, then this has just been all. Yeah, I don't know if the, the first comment says, you know, the community contributions and subtitles just turned on for this video. Maybe it just hasn't come into effect on YouTube. I don't see a closed caption option. Yeah. Somebody help us out. <laughs> so we can watch this again. So we can watch this again. I'll, I'll practice my Mandarin and play this game. What's up, Dragos? Welcome, welcome. What's up? You're checking out the first gameplay of this game, Black Myth, Black Myth Wukong. The sound is great. The graphics are great. The graphics are really good. Oh, snap. 20 dudes, bring it. Ah. Bring it, got it. I'm the monkey king. Can't stop me. <laughs> oh. Whoa. 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 What a transformation. Yeah! Whoop that ass! Ah! He ulted! He was waiting to use that R. Yeah. That was awesome. That's cool. I just love these folk games coming out and, yeah. you know, games like, um... Why am I blanking on it? The samurai. Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima, Ghost of Tsushima yeah. Sekiro, you know, taking place in like way, way older times. 
I would love to be like testing this game. It just looks like yeah. so much fun. Yeah, the Marone hype is, is very high right now, everybody. <laughs> okay. Boss battle. Alrighty. Is that Rengar? Go back to the big version. Oh, you gotta fight Tiny. Yeah, the fur does look amazing. Yeah. I'm so impressed with these graphics. Me too. Now I'm thinking about how punishing is this game? Like, how long will I be spending on this boss battle? Right. Yeah, this is pre-alpha, apparently. Pre-alpha. Pre footage. Somehow. Okay. There's no console confirmation on this yet. Okay. Oh, familiars? Cool. Friends, I need help. <sighs> <laughs> Go. Go get him. Yeah. I choose you, mini squadron. Ooh, mini squadron gone. We transformed again. I've noticed so many different elements of this fight. There's this time stopping, there's this fire, you know, calling out your squadron. Oh, nice, the fur's on fire. That's really cool. Whoa. Yeah, he's like reacting to the fire. Oh my God, that's so Dang. awesome. I wonder how long your ult is kind of on cooldown for, or if you have to like earn, if you get enough hits, maybe you can do it again. Cause we yeah. haven't seen big monkey mode yeah, in a, we haven't in a while. Seen it again. I would be big monkey mode right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. This calls for it. Yeah. GG! Yeah, GG no re. great too. <laughs> wow. Oh! Oh, what are you gonna do? Hold it out of, that's my next magic trick. <gasps> Who dat? <laughs> Who dat? Who dare? Get those nails done, girl. Another monkey? Oh, snap. Is it like yourself? I don't know. I I want to know more. It's the gorilla kid. <laughs> Tarzan and now. Whoa. Scary. This looks so epic. Yeah, this looks really oh, well great. done. All the different bosses. Is that a giant? No. Yes. Three, four. And he's like, I'll fight him. Is that a dragon? Yeah, great score. We stand a king. Wow. Like. Wow. What? That was crazy.
mysterious. This game better be up for awards. I've only seen 13 minutes of gameplay and I'm <laughs> pre -alpha. already like, pre-alpha. And I'm like, this needs to be nominated for something. For multiple wow. things. Wow. I'm looking at the comments here and people are saying, thanks for making my childhood dream become ultra super realistic, absolutely incredible. More gameplay shown than the entire Microsoft game showcase <laughs> burn. Most of the most of the comments are like, this is a dream come true. This that that looks so good. I need to be playing that right now. I have, a, yeah. I, have I have so much interest in playing that game. Like I have the interest in playing Cyberpunk 2077. Just watching that gameplay. Any in mm. the sequences at the end after the fire on the fur and yeah. it reacting to that, like just witnessing that. Oh my th that little level of detail is 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 just so profound. This looks so cool. I wish I knew Mandarin to, you know, double experience this game. I hope we hear more about, you know, when is this going to be coming out? How long is this game going to be? A lot of people really have their fingers tightly crossed um, in hopes that the final result is going to be as cool as the game trailer looks because it looks just great so far. I can't wait for this game to come out. I am all about it. Uh, yeah, all about it. And speaking of cool uh, is our is our next story before we finish out with on this day in gaming is something that's really cool that we want to talk about which is the surgeon simulator developers allowing their employees to work from home if they want to permanently so this is before, yes, this is before our On This Day in Gaming, which we're going to wrap up with. But this is good news, I think, about, you know, Surgeon Simulator. Um, as Boss of Studios, the UK developer behind Surgeon Simulator and I Am Bread, has made a significant adjustment to his workplace policies regarding remote work in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. So according to GI Biz, developers now have the option to permanently work from home, come into the London office, or move between home and the office as quote unquote, what best suits their working preference and personal needs. Bassa conducted an employee survey and found that 43% of developers said that they were more productive working from home. Respondents also said that they enjoyed the flexible hours, more time with family, and no commute. In total, 78% of respondents said they either preferred working from home or were impartial about going to the office. Those who do elect to return to the office will encounter changes to the physical space to make sure workstations properly adhere to social distancing guidelines. Personal protective equipment items are also available to staffers who work in the office. Bossa Studios is a relatively small developer, and it will be interesting to see how other studios of a similar scale, as well as bigger teams, adjust their workplace policies going forward. Adjusting to the new work from home setup for studios hasn't been without its issues in some cases. For example, Halo Infinite developer 343 Industries recently announced that issues related to working from home was one of the reasons for the game's delay. I really like how there's an option here, you know, for the workers. A lot of people say they like working from home. I personally do, as you know, as Kai and Chat says, the commute is huge. If there's um, even to commuting places close to me in LA, you have to commute and find parking. It ends up being an hour. And then I might spend, I don't know, an hour getting ready. Maybe if I'm making myself food, packing lunch, you know, getting ready to go. And then an hour getting home, that's three hours that I could have just not have spent doing yeah. that, that I might now have because I'm working from home. This is also great for, you know, those with disabilities who were told in the past that they could not work from home, that their job did not allow it. And they're like, well, I'm doing it right now. So you don't have that excuse anymore. More. Yeah, good on them uh, for allowing that choice to be there, which is what it needs. I mean, I just believe in that so much, like give the employees the choice. And if their work performance still maintains, then you made the right decision. And if it increases, great. And if it decreases, then address it. But don't assume just because someone's going to work from home, they're going to have issues. Don't take the assumption that the 343 industry situation uh, will happen to you as well. So I really like this approach. I'm excited to see that they're doing this and just hats off to them for, for implementing this. 
Me too. And I think it's good for, you know, companies to assess what their company specifically needs, because I know it can be difficult, especially if there's large files that you have to, you know, pass around can be hard to work with, you know, making sure everyone has the right setup to be able to work. But, you know, we've also seen um, companies like the one behind moving out, which said that they've already kind of worked remotely to begin with because their team is all over the place. Yeah. And, you know, They've, they haven't had to make, you know, that much of a change, you know, to adapt to current times. Um, and it can work for a lot of companies. Um, I hope to see this as a trend continue um, to allow, you know, employees that flexibility. Amen to that. Later, Dragos and Kane Guardian, we will catch y'all. But we have one final segment, which it's Thursday. So Throwback Thursday, we like to take a look at on this day in gaming. What has come out? What is something that we remember? And funny enough, a game that I think deserves a re-envisioning, a reboot, uh, not like they did with the movie, but just with the game itself, is on this day in gaming, back on the PlayStation 2, The Thing came out. The Thing came out in 2002, initially on Windows. So The Thing game is a 2002 third-person shooter survival horror video game developed by Computer Artworks and co-published by Universal Interactive under their Black Label Games publishing label and Konami. It was released for Windows, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. And it was set as a sequel to John Carpenter's 1982 film of the same name, and this story focuses on Captain Blake, a member of the U.S. Special Forces, that team that is sent to the Antarctic outpost, featured in the film to determine what has happened to the research team. The game was even endorsed by Carpenter, who voices a character in, the un in an uncredited cameo. The Thing received generally favorable reviews on all three platforms. The PlayStation 2 version holds an aggregate score of 78 out of 100 on Metacritic based on 27 reviews. The Xbox version also a 78 out of 100 based on 21 reviews. And the PC version a 77 out of 100, very close, one point less, based on 19 reviews. Yeah, and there actually was a sequel because of its critical and commercial success that was planned, but it was canceled when Computer Artworks went into receivership in October 2003. According to uh, Diarmid Campbell, uh, they had the contract in place to make the sequel, and they were pretty excited about it. They had a very cool prototype of dynamic infection and some really imaginative things like the outbursts. Um, some of the reviews say that, you know, people particularly like when one person would split in half and their their top half would like break out from the others. Um, some reviews weren't as forgiving, giving the game maybe a five out of 10, saying that it wasn't, you know, it didn't really live up to the hype. Um, someone from Eurogamer said as a squad based game, it would work far better if you ever had to care about a great deal for anyone's survival. So there's kind of mixed reviews on, you know, how much water it holds as a horror game yeah but overall people you know liked this experience and i think people just want to experience a movie in a game form sometimes yeah. it doesn't have to be you know like critically acclaimed like if i'm playing a stranger things game i think i'd want one better than the one that came out but it's more for fun it's yeah. not about you know being scared as i might as i might be you know watching the tv show yeah i was gonna say this is one of the first movie to game experiences that I had that I was impressed by it. There was elements looking back on it as I was watching some of the gameplay that I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. But now the way they're talking about what they can do with NPCs, how the the, the information is enhancing, you would have these squad mates, you would find them in the world and you would have them and you wouldn't know if they were infected or not. And you had to pay attention to them. So they were a part of your squad and you just really had to like, pick up on the clues that the game would yeah. give you that they were an infected or you unintentionally kill somebody thinking they're infected and they benefit your survival oh, in no. the game. So you could do a lot with that now uh, with a, uh, a lot of what's happening with, with game development, especially next gen. So I'd love to see uh, the thing come back for like PS5, Xbox Series X and PC. I think so too. They should bring it back. This game has got a great premise, you know, regardless of how well or, or how well it didn't do in the past. You know, I think it has a lot of potential. I think a lot of people know the title of the thing, even if you haven't, you know, watched the horror movie yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it would do really well. I want to see this become realized. That would be awesome. I would be such a fan of jumping back into that and just knowing how, how intense horror games have gotten. 
Uh, mm-hmm. This experience, if they did, maybe, and this is just a, just a food for thought. If they took like the alien isolation approach to the thing, yeah, where it wasn't all like guns and and everything, but you were trying to just survive someone who was infected, looking for you mm-hmm. on the base, I think would be uh, a great concept that they could apply to this this uh, IP. Spooky, scary stuff. <laughs> I hope that this is brought back. Um, I haven't heard anything about it, but I think it's about time because this game came out in 2002 on this day in gaming. On this day in gaming, the thing. 2002. Wow. I love how someone. I didn't. I didn't see who it said. Some. Someone was like, "Man, it was as old as me." And I was like, "Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's how how long some of us have been playing some games." Uh, But that does actually bring us to the end of the Daily Gaming News Hour. Thank you all so much for joining in on the chat and being a part of this. This is a really fun day, and I loved, oh my God, that gameplay of uh, Black Myth Wukong. That was great. It's still sticking in my head. That's great. I'm going to be following the developers and, you know, making sure that I'm up to date on the updates for for Black Myth Wukong um, because I definitely want to see that. But this does bring us to the end of our show, as Marona said. Thank you so much for joining. We're going to be live from 1 to 2 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And we've got a game developer interview lined up for you. So make sure you tune in for that. And don't forget, if you are watching us on our VODs, we are live, like Kaiser was saying, from 1 to 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. But then you can also check out our previous episodes on our YouTube channel, as well as here on Twitch, and catch up on all of your gaming news right here on Daily Gaming News. And just a real quick one before we sign off. The flavor I had in my LaCroix was lemon cello. This thing is bomb. I highly recommend it. Flavor. I highly recommend it. It tastes like a, it's like um vanilla lemon. I, yeah, it? I'm a fan. I, I hate I'm, a, it. I'm a super I big fan. <laughs> oh yeah, and don't, don't forget about the mailbag because if you have ideas or, or, or concepts or questions that you want to shoot over to us, just uh, uh, exclamation point mailbag in the chat. <laughs> it's Thank so funny. So it was much. a flavor you don't like. Yeah, a flavor I hate. Um, So we'll be running, you know, reruns of this episode and yesterday's episode right after the show. But thank you so much for joining us today. I am Kaisa. I am Roan. You all are amazing human beings. Thank you so much, DGN fam. We will see you next time. See ya.